Hey everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne. We're taking a look at uh, some of my content for my language and literacy class. Um, so by all means, this is for students in my classes as a refresher or as a substitute uh, or a, a scaffolding mechanism for the classes. Um, but if you're just someone that is interested in language and literacy development, then by all means, pay attention. Um, so this is the initial overview. This is week one, and we're taking a look at um, framing language and literacy development in our lives. Um, this is um, you know, appropriate for early childhood, elementary, middle grade, secondary, and I believe beyond. Um, a lot of my work, a lot of my thinking in language and literacy development courses is I think it's important to focus on the theory and the perspective so you understand, um, you know, conceptually what's happening. And then it's up to you as the educator to think about pedagogy and think about your students and integrate your ideas about human growth in other classes and make all of these connections, make everything make sense. So as we begin, a lot of my uh, slide decks and presentations begin with a tweetable summary. It's like an essential question to keep me on track um, and let you know where we are headed. So for me, I view language development um, in the context of this class and literacy development in the context of this class as being a, a gradual awareness and, and building knowledge uh, of language through there's five key concepts that I really focus on in, in this class and that's phonological, semantic, syntactic, morphemic, and pragmatic aspects of knowledge or, or developing those aspects of knowledge. So we'll see those again and again and again in this class. Um, so we'll think a lot about phonological, semantic, syntactic, morphemic, and pragmatic um, and think about oral and written language and the idea is to think about, okay, well, if I can say a student can read or if a student is struggling in writing, um, then specifically what are the aspects or what are these key components of language uh, that they're struggling with um, so we can make more sense of it. If you were in my class, uh, I begin with a, uh, a, a chance for us to write a quick write and think about our own experiences. And what we do is we talk about what is your home language um, I start the class with this as a way to bring everybody in and situate you back in uh, your time of your life, the time of your life when you started to really think about language and develop your language and develop those skills. Um, so we have a little bit of a turn and talk and use that as a way for me to set the stage, um, uh, contextualize all of this, but at the same time, allow the learner, all of you, uh, if you were in my class, to think about what this really means. So when we talk about language, really what we're talking about is a medium of communication. So we have individuals that want to express ideas to each other, um, and they have these thoughts in their head, they have these ideas in their heads, and they have to figure out a way that I can share this idea with you so you understand what's going on in my head. Um, language is a fundamental and essential component of all cultures. A lot of cultures are organized around language or they uh, language serves as a mediating factor to help uh, the culture expand and explode and it's really a way language is a way to help cultures connect um, and as i said at the beginning of this slide language really is communication is a system of symbols to clarify thinking so once again we're talking about ideas that you have in your head um, you know these mental constructs in your head that you're trying to explore explain and you're trying to share it with somebody else and one of the key ways that you can do this is through language. Um, one of the other things that I'd like to point out in this is this class and a lot of the texts that I use in this specific class view language, especially language competencies needed by children, as this very binary uh, idea. And so there is this look at language that is either oral or written and this language structure that is either receptive or expressive. So if we think about oral language, we're thinking about speaking and listening. If we think about written, we're thinking about reading and writing. Um, part of the problem with this is that um, it's very binary in nature. Um, and we'll see a lot of this like it's either or in these discussions as these textbooks uh, present language development. But I think language is more complex than that. Um, and so I think this is a good way to start thinking about language and literacy development. But then I think we need to expand beyond that. So drilling down, if we think about language knowledge, uh, once again, I, I talked about the five aspects of language knowledge um, that we will focus on in these videos and in this course. 
And those are phonological, semantic, syntactic, morphemic, and pragmatic. Um, each one of these five is, is important in and of itself. Each of the five um, has its own specific nuance that makes it a challenge for us to figure out and make sense of. Um, but these are key components that we will come back to again and again and again. Um, and in this class, you will be expected to know and master, uh, know and understand and master this and ultimately teach this to your peers um, so that later on in your career and in especially in, in other classes in literacy classes and language development classes you really understand what you're talking about so the first of this is phonological knowledge phonological knowledge is those sound symbol relationships in language it's uh, not really being able to look at a word and being able to like uh, correctly pronounce the word what we're looking at is the ability to look at a, a symbol um, you know looking at this symbol here if I can highlight this so looking at that symbol there okay now many of you are watching this video and you are saying that is the letter D um, but w think about before that before that before you know as we're learning that that is the letter D and as we're learning possibly that's the capital D um, what we're thinking about is that is a symbol that's a symbol just like this is a symbol right here this umbrella um, and that this you know this square is a symbol so that is a symbol um, yes it is a, attached to uh, a letter in the English language but for the most part it's a symbol and so the idea behind ph phonological knowledge at early ages in early childhood elementary is looking at that symbol and saying that is a symbol and it makes the sound duh that's phonological knowledge at its base elements, at its beginnings. Um, the interesting thing is that when we, we progress beyond that, so we start in, in early childhood and early years of elementary being able to make sense of those sound symbol relationships and the idea is that um, we have automaticity as students age. But um, as they progress, phonological knowledge does not go away. Um, we continuously build up that ability to discriminate those sounds and those abilities to, you know, discriminate those sounds as we hear them, but also produce those sounds. Sounds. So there's a lot of people that we know that they try to pronounce a word or they try to read a word that's a little bit complex and they can't really figure out how do I, how do I read this word or pronounce this word? Um, you know, if you read a word to someone and they try to write the word down, you see some people that struggle figuring out, oh, how do I take those sounds and unpack it and turn it into letters? So that's all phonological knowledge. And um, there's other ways that we see phonological knowledge rear its head in classes. Um, as an example, if you in later years in middle grades and high school and beyond, if you're interested in rhyme, rhyme scheme, if you're interested in poetry and lyrics, um, if you look at syllables, um, that is all uh, playing around with phonological awareness. So we see that in different variants, um, in different iterations as students uh, grow up. Then we move into semantic knowledge. Semantic knowledge is uh, understanding of, of the word and then the schema that we attach the word to. So schema um, or schemata is the, the mental stories in our brains, the ways that uh, we make sense of the world. So our brain tells our, our, ourselves, we tell ourselves stories to make sense of the world. Uh, and we sort of cluster or align different ideas together to make sense of the world. That's schema. So you might think about, um, you know, you might think about this apple here. And as you think about apple, you might think, okay, this is fruit. This is in the fruit family. And this is all types of foods. You might think about apples and think about that apple pie that your great aunt used to make all the time. Uh, you might think about apples and think about the orchard that you used to go to with the fi your family as a kid and pick apples. So those are all schema. Those are stories that you have saved up in your head. Um, there's a lot of emotion with it. There's a lot of receptive knowledge uh, and expressive knowledge associated with that. But it's all stories that you have that it's your way, your brain's way of making sense of the world. And so semantic knowledge is the, the stories behind the words. And so it's thinking about those words and those word labels and thinking about how they are similar or different and making those interrelationships. So as an example for thinking about Apple, um, if I say Apple, if you are in nutrition, um, you know, where you're a cook, uh, you might think, okay, well, Apple is that fruit and it's that food. Um, whereas if you are in technology, like I am in many of my, my groups, 
we think about Apple, a lot of people think about the uh, the device manufacturer. Um, you know, we think about the iPods and iPhones and stuff like that. So there are different schema, and depending on who you're talking to or their worldview, it's going to make a difference um, what sort of representation they have of this. We move on to morphemic knowledge. Phonological knowledge really is somewhat easy to figure out, even though it presents some challenges. Semantic knowledge um, also presents challenges because people confuse it with syntactic knowledge, which is next. Morphemic is also related to syntactic, which is the next slide. But morphemic, what they're doing is they're looking at word structure. So they're looking at the individual elements, the, um, the morphemes in words, and the way that we rearrange those structures in the words, what does that do for the meaning of the word? So if we take the word friend, um, if we add a prefix or a suffix to it, we can see the word change. Um, we can see the way that those morphemes stack up in the word. But morphemic knowledge is looking at individual word structure or those, those units within the word that make the word what it is. Um, if we take a step up, not really up, but maybe across into syntactic knowledge, we're moving beyond the word into uh, phrases or clusters or sentences. So syntactic knowledge is thinking about syntax. It's thinking about the rules or the grammar of word use and word structure beyond the initial word. So morphemic is that one word, that one unit. Once we move, move beyond the word, then we get into syntactic knowledge. And that's knowing how phrases and sentences are structured so that you can communicate so other people know what you're talking about. So syntactic knowledge is thinking about, okay, how do I structure this sentence so that I make sure that the person on the other end is going to understand me. So if I'm talking to you and I'm trying to explain a story that I saw or something that happened to me at dinner, you know, I would say they ate the pizza with anchovies. And I am actively structuring that sentence in a way to help you understand what occurred. So this is communication. Um, so even now, as these words are coming out of my mouth, my brain is actively staggering and segmenting and, and um, manipulating the structure of the sentence to best help you, the listener, make sense of what I'm trying to communicate. That's syntactic knowledge. So I would say they ate the pizza with anchovies. I would not say, you know, they or ate they pizza the with you know, anchovies with. I wouldn't rearrange the structure just to play. Um, if I really want you to understand what I'm talking about. The last of the big five that we'll talk about in this class is pragmatic knowledge. Um, pragmatic knowledge is thinking about social cultural settings for words. So we have to understand that language is, in it, language is used in different places, um, in different capacities, um, and all of that is impacted by social cultural settings. So we'll talk about register later in this class. We'll talk about gender. We'll talk about different rules or different um, genre of text. But pragmatic knowledge is basically using language differently in different social cultural settings. So as an example, you might speak and talk with your friends um, different ways if you were in class or if you were in um, you know, a restaurant or if you were at a baseball game or you were in church. Um, you might uh, speak with people in a different way if you were at home with your grandparents eating dinner as opposed to out with um, friends walking through the streets on a, at night on, on a walk. Um, so it's thinking about those social cultural settings and what are those sort of rules and expectations there. So as we're unpacking that this, we need to make sense of how all of these interact. So a lot of our work will be looking at phonological knowledge, morphemic knowledge, syntactic, semantic, and pragmatic aspects of knowledge, and how, how all of those sort of um, layer upon themselves to help build what all of this means um, as we talk about an individual that is a literate person or, or they develop language. So in my class, one of the things that we do is I have you and your groups define one of those big five. And it's a way for us to think about what it means. You go online, you use the textbooks, and you as a group basically define what this means and, and you share it with the rest of the class. Um, it's a good way for us to start to unpack it. At this point in class, I don't expect that anyone really understands these, but at least you start to, to use the words. You start to, to talk to talk. 
Uh, there's different levels that we unpack as part of language knowledge. Um, when we look at our students in our classes, they, they will develop linguistic knowledge and then build upon that and build metalinguistic knowledge. Um, and then they have to be able to verbalize that. They have to be able to make sense of it and express that to other people. One of the other things that we've talked about, um, we will talk about this class, and I talked about it earlier in this slide deck, is the different modes and forms. Once again, this is uh, problematic for me. Uh, I view this is, is very binary, and I think it's somewhat limiting. But we look at oral and written language, and we think about oral language as primarily being listening and speaking, and then written being reading and writing. Once again, we'll keep unpacking this and, and talking about the problems associated with being that binary and that limited in our understanding of what language development is. Um, but the thing to keep in mind here, and I'll, and I'll keep problematizing this uh, throughout the class, is that for the most part, this is what we expect in our classes. Um, you know, when you come to one of my classes, your expectation is that I will speak to you and that I will speak in the English language and that my expectation is you will be able to listen and primarily come in and listen in the English language. Um, you know, there are going to be times that I, I sort of stumble through my words and, and try to make a joke that falls flat. But for the most part, I'm trying to speak English and the expectation is that you can can understand that and, and we can uh, communicate on that level. So um, for the most part in our classes, that's the primary mode of communication is that that oral and written and the reading and the writing and the listening and speaking. Um, we don't, I do not believe that we spend enough time veering out of those sort of binary modes, but we'll keep unpacking that. So we need to, to think about what role language uh, development and these competencies play in the lives of our children. Um, so you are building, if you're in early childhood, elementary, and I would also suggest if you're in middle grades, high school, and beyond, um, that you are building up that uh, basic capacities for learners to engage with the language system. You are building up their capacities to uh, understand and engage in, in written language. Um, they can write and express themselves, that they can listen and learn from other people. Um, they can read and learn from other people or other groups. Um, so you are giving them the basis. That's one of the key components. Um, if we were to boil down education, what is the key components? As a literacy educator, I think it's being able to uh, help you survive as a literate individual in these spaces. Um, and at the same time, I think that you are enabling or empowering your students to be effective communicators, um, help them in social interactions, but also learning activities. Um, and, and so the, the last thing that I do in this uh, first week is we look at the role of play. And so I have a video in there that you can click through. You'll have access to this slide deck. Um, but by all means, please watch the video. Think about play. Think about the role of play in our classrooms. And how does play, uh, how does play play a role? Uh, what sort of role does play play? I can't get out of it. Uh, how important is play in our classes? I'll go with that. Um, so what, how important is it? And when does play stop? Like when is play not an important resource or an important tool for learning? So something to think critically about as we sort of start up this class. So by all means, um, thank you for paying attention. Um, if you're here and you're paying attention for class, uh, thank you for doing what you're supposed to do. If you're here and you're just interested in language development and you're trying to figure out uh, what I have to say about it for some reason. Um, thank you for paying attention. Um, once again, this is the first slide deck or the first PowerPoint, if you will, in my class uh, all about language development and literacy development in our lives. So thanks a ton and have a great day.